Right, so welcome everyone to our fifth Wednesday presentation here at Sierra Foothills Amateur Radio Club. It is our pleasure to introduce Al Rovner, Kilo 7 Alpha Romeo tonight. Al was first licensed in 1971 as Whiskey Alpha 2 Tango Mary Papa in New Jersey. Al received Kilo 7 Alpha Romeo with the Vanity Program in 1996. He lives in Vancouver, Washington, and is a retired engineer and avid DXer and contester. Al has participated in 28 D-Expeditions with the last 11 years in the South Pacific. For the last seven expeditions, Al has become an expert in using the Fox mode in FT8, and we'll discuss how that works in this presentation. And with that, microphone is yours, Al. Well, thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the shack here in uh, in Vancouver. So I've always wanted to be a fox. Well, that was the original title of this talk. And for QST, I changed it to an introduction to WSJT's the expedition mode. At the end of this talk, I have a big announcement. So you'll have to wait till the end to hear that. So... On one of my trips to the Pacific, one of my friends suggested I, I add FT8. I said, what's that? Okay, so I put it on my, where's that slide? I put it on my laptop right before I was leaving for Samoa. And I really had no idea what to do with it until I got there. But I had all the hardware needed to, to do audio. Uh, modes. So, like I said, I've been the last 10 or 11 years I've gone to the Pacific, and these are the Pacific uh, call signs I've used. The ones that are in yellow are where I've operated as a fox. So the last, what is that, five or five expeditions I've operated as a fox. So when I when I fired up from Samoa, I read the documentation and I started making my first QSOs. I had no idea what was going on. And I had the pleasure of meeting Atsu 5W1SA and he helped me. I got on and called CQ and I had 20 JAs call me. And I wasn't sure what to do. And the, the 15 second timer timed out and I called CQ again. And I had like 40 JAs call me. Now I'm, I'm, I'm in trouble. So I finally figured out I can click on them to have a contact with them. But what I found is working these stations one at a time was slow and tedious. And it was made worse if retries were involved. And there were a lot of guys calling me. I think the developers of WSJT realized this. And a year later they came out with this de-expedition mode. And you can see K1JT's description of it, where I can run up to five simultaneous signals and allowing rates of 500 per hour. Now, I've never seen that, but I have seen over 400. And I'll give you a few examples of that. So we're gonna talk about how to set up as a hound what you should do as a hound and what you should not do as a hound. So in order to set up, you need to go into the settings, WSJT, and you need to change these three settings. Monitor returns to last frequency. You need to be, be in split mode, either rig or fake it. And then you need to select hound from special activity. And when you do that, you get a red marker at the bottom center of your screen. Okay. So now let's say, oh, I, I just heard Bouvet Island. He's in, I want to set up as a hound to, to call him. Okay. So I need to put his frequency into the frequencies table. So I'm going to go back to the settings page. I'm going to select the tab for frequencies. I'm going to right click in anywhere in the table and select insert. And when I do that, I get a new screen 
where I can add the mode and the frequency as shown here. So that frequency, in this case 14.090, will now show up in your drop down list of frequencies. So you can tune to that frequency. You then want to set your transmit frequency well above 1,000 hertz. I don't mean 1,001 or 1,002. I mean well above due to inaccuracies in frequency placement. Okay. Recent, uh, so I should mention, I'm loosely involved with the WSJT development team. I've submitted several bugs to them, and I've complained that People are calling me below a thousand hertz, and there's so many of them that it makes it hard to see the people who are calling above 1,000. So they implemented a new rule in recent software where I won't even see callers below a thousand hertz. They're not displayed at all. So if you do that, the Fox won't even know you're there. Also, the odd and even checkbox is locked and grayed out, and you can't change it. And that's, that's just for this de-expedition mode. This is an important screen. This has this how, what I call the how checklist, what you need to do to be successful. And probably the number one item is make sure you can hear the fox. If he's listed on the spotting network and you tune to that frequency and you can't hear him, there's, there's no reason to call really. So you're now going to put Bouvet into the call field and click that Generate Standard Messages button. You set your frequency above 1,000, select that TX1 field, and hit Enable TX. Now you'll start calling the Fox. Now what happens after that? I'm going to show you a close-up of a few screens that the Fox sees, and then I'll show you the entire screen. Okay. So your goal, your goal is to show up in this station's calling window. And in this case, I'm displaying actual values from my trip to Lord Howe Island. Okay. This window can be sorted by several of the columns shown, can be sorted alphabetically by call sign, by grid square, by signal strength, by distance. And I especially like the distance one. If, if I do, if I sort by strongest signal, I get a, a window full of JAs. There's nothing wrong with that, except there's other people calling that I can't see in that case. And here you can see, I have a station from Puerto Rico that's over 15,000 kilometers away that's calling. So you want to appear in this screen. And when I refer to myself as I, I'm talking about the Fox. So I'm going to double click an entry in this window. And that moves that call sign into this queue. Okay, the queue holds 10 stations. And when I add a station to the queue, they appear at the bottom of the queue. And the software, as a fox, will attempt to contact who's ever at the top of the queue and move them to in progress. And more than one station can be in progress, as you see here. And I happen to be having a conversation with NA2AA, the CEO of the ARRL. I... I sent him a screenshot and he was absolutely thrilled to have a contact because that's a long way from Connecticut. Okay. So you get placed into this queue and as stations are work, you bubble up through the queue. Okay. So whoever was second now becomes first, whoever was third now becomes second and so forth. This in turn opens up new slots at the bottom where I can put more people. Okay, so look at the values on the right side of this box. You have, in this case, I'm sorting by distance. N list means 
how many call signs do I want to see in that station's calling window? Max DB allows me to not see really strong stations if I choose to do so. I've never done that. In other words, I could favor weak stations if I wanted to do that, but I never have. What, what we call streams, the software refers to as slots. So N slots one means I'm transmitting with one stream and I can change that. The CQ field allows me to set a directed CQ. I can drop from that list, I can pick CQ NA, CQ EU, whatever. And the directed CQ is strictly enforced. If I have it set to CQNA, anyone that's outside NA will not be displayed. Okay. So as I said, the Fox double clicks a call sign, you get moved to the queue. Each station bubbles up through the queue. I should read my text before talking about it. <laughs> um, you then move to the in progress screen. Now there's a new feature where if I find one of my buddies like AI6US, I can move him right to the top of the queue by alt double clicking, okay? And I do that with people I know. I move them right to the top of the queue so they don't have to wait, just for club members and buddies. This is what the entire laptop screen looks like. And here you can see the station's calling window, you can see the queue and the in progress, the end slots, and so forth. And you can see the red and yellow uh, received and transmitted text. Here again, I'm sorting by distance. So this, this is what the fox sees. And on the left side, I have N1MM running where... I have WSJT set up to broadcast contacts to N1MM. And that way I can keep all my contacts in one log that make it easy to upload the club log once or twice a day. Okay. So I said you move from the queue to in progress. Well, what happens? This is one of the most important screens in my talk. So I want everybody to pay attention. As a hound, you have five opportunities to complete a QSO, okay? The first three of those opportunities are active. The FOX will send you a report and expects back a reply report. If a reply report is received, the FOX will send the hound in RR73 and log the QSO, okay? So the first three of those five opportunities are active. The second two are passive. The Fox will then call whoever the next station is in the queue and will listen for two more 15 second cycles for the first hound's reply. Okay, that's called a grace period. If a reply is received, that station will still get sent an RR73 and log. And I have an example of that to show you. So what happens if all these five opportunities fail? Okay, in that case, uh, the Fox will not make any other attempts to listen for that station. That station has forfeited that opportunity. And here's where people get confused what should you do in this case? Okay, you want to reset everything, go back to that hound checklist, set your frequency above a thousand, select the TX1 field, and call again. Okay, and you want to reappear in that station's calling window and start all over again. What should you not do? Don't, I've seen people call me for over an hour, sending their report over and over again, and the Fox will ignore that, will not reply, okay? So you have to go back and reset, as I previously said. 
I've seen dozens, if not hundreds of people mess this up. So this is the probably the most important thing to learn. Okay. Now I've seen some people call for over an hour and all they do is get frustrated. Okay. So let's look at an example of what not to do. But before I do that, I want to show you a, a couple items. If you look in the in progress section at the bottom right, there's a Kilo Mike 4 station that is currently on the fifth of five opportunities. You can't read what that says in the parentheses, but it says RX. It's a little bit chopped off. Okay. So this Kilo Mike 4 is in his fifth opportunity and will be dropped. Uh, if no reply report is received. Also, if we look at that station's calling window, there's an Echo Alpha 8 at the top. That's 19,500 kilometers from Lord Howe Island. So that's the other side of the earth. And that's why I like to sort by distance, because you get, you get some of those nuggets like that that are really far away. And even VE3 and the East Coast, they're still 14,000 kilometers away. So uh, that's why I like to sort by distance. And what I do as a fox is I bounce back and forth. I'll go between signal strength and distance, alphabetic call sign, grid square, ju just to see who's there that I might have missed. I want to look in detail at this red and yellow section and go through every line of it. So here we see a JA7 sending me a report. So this is how the Fox operates. I send him an RR73 and I send one report to this JH1. I get no reply. I send a second report to the JH1, no reply. Send a third report to the JH1, no reply. He now has used up his three active cycles and I select the next station in the queue, N9RC. I send N9RC a report with no reply. Second report with no reply. Third report with no reply. I then pick the next station from the queue, K4UWC, where I get an immediate reply. So I send him an RR73 and send a report to the next station, Kilo Mike 4. Meanwhile, N9RC decides to reply to me by, remember I said, don't send a report over and over again. Well, that's what he's doing. Okay, and N9RC is ignored by the Fox, and the Fox keeps calling this Kilo Mike 4. That's because N9RC has used up his three active cycles and his two grace period cycles, and the Fox is ignoring him, and he's not following my recommendation to reset everything and call again from scratch. And I don't know, I'd have to look up. I don't know if he ever did make it into the log. Okay. Here's an example of November Echo 7 Delta, who's a friend of mine in Salem, Oregon. I send him two, three reports with no reply. By the way, AI9Q happens to live about a mile from me. And he is also calling out of sequence by sending his report over and over and is ignored by the Fox. But meanwhile, so, okay, back up. I send NE7D three reports. He doesn't reply, so I talk to W3BNN. Meanwhile, NE7D does send a report during the grace period. So I acknowledge that by sending an RR73 and then continuing with W3BNN. So this is an example of how you use the fourth 
I guess in this case, it's the fourth of five opportunities to get in the log, okay? Bandwidth and QSO rates. If I go on 14074 or other common frequencies, I can make a maximum of 60 QSOs per hour. And as a de-expedition, it's a little bit slow. Now, if I change to one stream as a Fox, I can double that and go to 120 QSOs per hour. That's better. If I go to two streams, I can go to 240 QSOs per hour. And if I go to three or four, I can get higher than that. And I've seen the rate meter go well above that. And I have some examples to show you. And anytime retries occur, that theoretical rate goes down. So this is what one stream operation looks like. And if you look at that yellow and red area, it's a perfect example. I send a KP2 or uh, he sends me a reply. I send an RR73, W5ZJ sends me a reply, VE6 sends a reply, VK7 sends a reply. So I'm sending two RR73s per minute, one at zero seconds and one at 30 seconds for a rate of 120 QSOs per hour. And this is what happens when it works well and everybody replies right away. So here's two stream operation. And this is similar. I send a report to the Sugar Victor 3 and Echo Whiskey 4, and they come right back. And then I send a report to MM0, Charlie United 3, they come right back, and so forth. And you get this characteristic striping effect, this red and yellow striping. So now I'm sending four RR73s per hour, two on the zeros, two on the 30 second mark. So in this case, I'm running 240 QSOs per hour. And by the way, this screen has a software bug on it. The station's calling window has a small font that's all squished together. I reported that to the development team and they said they have seen it, but are unable to reproduce it. So we'll see what happens with that. Uh, I'm, I'm very good at finding bugs. So let's look at these streams. And I'm going to tell you at the end of my presentation that all this has changed, but I'll review it for you anyway. So in this case, the Fox has two streams that are 50 cycles wide with a 10 cycle gap in between them. So the first stream goes from 600 to 650. There's a 10 cycle gap and then 660 to 710. If there was a third stream, it would start at 720. And the hound actually moves themselves down to those frequencies. So here you can see Mike Mike Zero and Charlie United Three move down to 600 and 660. And these two guys on the bottom, I'm guessing they were not properly set up as a hound, but I, I came back to them anyway. But they did not move down to 600 and 660. Here's an example of a fox transmitting four streams. This was taken from my home station. And I have news that this is about to change, coming up later. So what, what are your responsibilities as a hound? You've probably enabled hound mode as I've covered before. You verify you can hear the fox. You follow the checklist. You, and this is the important one. You understand how to initiate another QSO if that first one was not acknowledged. Have patience. You have no way of knowing if you're in the queue or where you are in the queue or if you're even in there at all. 
There's no way to know. I, I turned off my enabled TX one day and a minute or two later, my transmitter came on all by itself and made the contact because I was at the bottom of the queue and it took a minute or so to make my way through it. What are my responsibilities as a Fox? Obviously properly enable Fox mode. This is, to be honest with you, this is something that bothers me. Don't call CQ on standard frequencies. All it does is create congestion and QRM. In fact, WSJT will not allow this to happen. If In WSJT, if you try to set up as a Fox on 14074, you get an error message. <clears throat> so you want to move stations from that station's calling window into the queue. You want to keep the queue as full as possible. And you want to manage end slots to maximize the QSO count. But be aware the power output drops. That's part of my big announcement coming up. And this is an interesting one. Equitably work all areas of the world. One of my favorite bands is 30 meters. I literally can have all continents calling me on 30 meters. And I try to give everybody an equal opportunity to have a contact. Um, rather than work all North America or all Europe, etc. <clears throat> so here's our little station at Victor Kilo 9, Lima Alpha Alpha, and my traveling expedition partner, Bob, W7YAQ. And you can see our, our two Elecraft K3 stations there. Here comes the big announcement, okay? Changes to WSJT, Super Fox and Super Hound modes. Uh, the Fox will no longer transmit those 50 hertz wide streams. They're going to send one signal 1500 hertz wide <clears throat> that sounds like this. It's not a tone that wobbles. It goes beep, boop, boop, beep, boop, bop, bop, beep, boop, like that. It's just all these little tones that bounce all around. Super Fox will be able to have contacts with up to nine stations at one time, nine hounds. And that signal strength that you hear on your end won't go down with transmitting up to nine stations. The full power output will be used at all times. Okay. Also, <clears throat> there's a lot of issues with piracy, especially with this Glorioso station that's on now. Um, he's having a lot of problems with pirates. The Super Fox mode will include a dig digital signature that verifies the authenticity of the Fox. And you'll get a message that says Fox's call sign valid. This will pretty much knock out piracy. Um, the super hound mode is also selectable. So you have to properly set up as a super hound to do this. Okay. Now, these changes will be rolling out over the next several months. I have a test copy here that I've been uh, working with the developers to go through and, and comment on. And it's going to be used big time with this Jarvis Island operation in August. So if you want to work Jarvis in August, uh, you'll need to get this new software. It will be widely released and widely available. So there'll be no problems with that. And with that, I will say RR73 to you all and be happy to field any questions. So first off, on behalf of SFARC and all the participants on tonight's Zoom meeting, I would like to thank Al Kilo 7 Alpha Romeo for the wonderful and informative presentation. First question, please come now. Now we're polite. <laughs> this is Tim. This is hey, Tim, KD6 HOF. I have a hey. question. <clears throat> Is the super hound um, to replace the old method or is it an addition to what we have now? The new software will include the same fox and hound modes you use now. 
uh, in addition to including Super Fox and Super Hound. So they'll all be available. And if I understand it correctly, as a Super Hound, the techniques that I showed you are still applicable with the one exception that you don't have to call above a thousand cycles. I believe you will, as a hound, you'll still transmit a 50 cycle stream like you did before. But I assume okay. that we should never transmit on the same frequencies that the Fox are using until we are pulled there. That's correct. And I believe that that is also no longer true. That if you're calling at 1500 cycles, you will stay at 1500 cycles. That the super hound will just stay wherever they're calling at. I think that's going to be a game changer for the power level. You know, right now, every stream just cuts your power down, down, down. And so, probably as a fox, that's a big choice that you have to make. I that's a very valid point, Ryan. Look at this Glorioso station. Yesterday, he, for some time, he went down to one stream, and he was plus 08 here. And at five streams, he was minus 17. Okay, so uh, not losing that signal-to-noise ratio is really, really going to be a boon to upcoming expeditions, and they'll just be able to get more and more people in their log. I do have a question. If a hound is not calling you in hound mode and he's using traditional mode and you make that choice to work them, do, do, do they still fall into the same operation for you as a fox for how you handle them? Uh, by not pulling them down to your frequency below a thousand. I believe that's true. I, I, as long as you're calling above a thousand, you will appear in the station's calling window. And I, I showed you that one slide where a couple of the guys were not moved down, yet they apparently still had a valid contact. I think that's true. Now, now this of course. Go ahead, Jerry. Sorry, I, I have a ton of questions, but <laughs> sorry. Uh, how unusual. You have a lot to say. <laughs> Hi, Al. This is Jerry, wa 6 e You were mentioning the frequencies, and as a, uh, a user chasing this kind of thing, do, do you get on and run all this right at 14074, for example, or do you move it somewhere else? And how do I, as a mere user, find out where you are if I don't happen to see it in the press somewhere? Well, so as a fox, I'll go park on 14085 or 14090. And I, I run a DX spotting network here. It's about three feet from where I'm sitting. And I'll tell that into my spotting network and announce myself. I'll spot myself on 14090. Yeah, okay. And usually within just a couple minutes, I have a big pile up. Uh, DX spotting is probably one of the answers. I did it once, but it was because Brian told me, hey, Jerry, go over here. And sure enough. Thank you, yeah. Al. So, but, well, there, there's more comment. Um, especially toward the end of an expedition, things get a little quieter. Um, we're we're kind of not a shiny new de-expedition anymore. We, we've been on the air for 10 days. And things are a little quiet. In which case, I will go to 14074 or 21074, but I'll operate in regular mode, not, not Fox mode. I understand. Thank you. You know, often, Al, I'm asked, how do I tell if uh, the station's running in Foxhound? You know, I, I find it easy to identify once I see multiple stations being called back in the same slot or stream. But... Uh, you know, there is another mode out there of, uh, as well. There's, it, it's not always easy to tell. If you see an RR73 semicolon and then another report, the station is either in multi-stream mode or he's in Foxhound mode. And I'll, I'll tell you that I'm sure you've all heard of this MSHV software. I think 
honestly, all that does is confuse people. They, they don't know what mode to be in. They don't know whether to call as a fox or where to call. And all it does is confuse people. But, you know, so be it. It's uh, I found if I set up as a hound, even with MSHV, it seems to work fine. Other questions? I do have one more if nobody else does. Actually, I have a question. <laughs> Hi, Al. My name is Christina, AK6DU. And I am very newly licensed, just starting in December, which may be why I have a very basic question. What makes something a de-expedition? Um, someone like me decides to travel to another country and take with me my radio gear, my laptop, power supplies, cables, antennas, coax, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and set up somewhere on a beach near salt water, okay? Um, so a de-expedition is a, group, a single ham or a group of hams that go to uh, a what might be a rare location. For example, this Glorioso Island is in between, I hope I get this right, is in between Africa and Madagascar. I haven't had a contact with them in 15 years. And the activity there has been virtually zero. So when someone decides to go there and get on the air, it's a big deal. And he has people from all over the world calling him. Now, you don't have to go to a rare location. You can go to the Bahamas. You can go to Bermuda. Okay. I have another presentation uh, uh, called Going on Your First De-Expedition that maybe I can... Uh, present to you guys at some time. But uh, you just, just, just go somewhere, the Cayman Islands, the Cook Islands, and take your radio equipment with you. Now, there's a number of prerequisites, like you have to be licensed. You don't just show up. You may need import permission to bring your equipment into the country. But does that answer your question? That does, although it does bring up follow-up questions. <laughs> is it something that you like have to register for ahead of time? Or you mentioned license, so you would have to get licensed in that country? You, you don't have to register with anyone. Um, you do need to be licensed. So let's say you wanted to go to French Polynesia. You wanted to go to Tahiti or Bora Bora. All countries have... I, I refer to them as a telecom department. Telecom manages all communications, uh, radio, television, internet, cell phones, amateur radio. And in, the, in French Polynesia, you can just write to them and ask that they send you a temporary application for an amateur radio license. They'll send it to you in, by email. You fill it out. You send it back with a copy of your US license. And they usually want to see the photo page of your passport. They want a copy of that. And then you send that back to them and they'll email you back your license. What varies is how long is this license good for? I think in French Polynesia, it's only a couple months. A, a lot of locations, it's good for one year. Okay, and they'll charge you. French Polynesia didn't charge me anything. It was completely free. In the Cook Islands, it's twenty dollars. New Zealand, uh, in Tonga, it was twenty or thirty dollars American money. Um, but that's basically it. Other than that, nice. um, you don't you don't need to announce yourself to anybody. I'm sorry. One more follow up question, then I'll let other people ask questions. Um, is there a web page or something where people who are on the expeditions are posting that if I want to kind of follow what's out there, what people are planning, what, you know, people are currently out there, or you, do you just kind of find them? <laughs> you, you bring up a subject that's in my going on your first de <laughs> talk, and that I'm is, ready for that presentation. Let's do it. <laughs> that is now that you, you've decided to go somewhere, you need to publicize it. Uh -huh. You need to let people know in advance, 
I'm going to this location on these dates. I'll be on these bands. I'll be participating in this contest. Um, and there's a couple sites that I recommend. Uh, there's the Daily DX and the Weekly DX from Bernie, W3UR. Um, I stay in touch with him a lot when I travel. Um, there's a, a website called dx-world.net that is run uh, by a European ham. And so what I do is I announce my trip with them. I also provide real-time updates. When real, Here's an example of a real-time update. A couple years ago, I went to Vanuatu with my friend Bob. All of our radio equipment was confiscated and locked up by their customs people. So I sent an email to W3UR informing him that we're going to be delayed getting on the air because all of our darn equipment was confiscated and locked up. So he put that in his world newsletter. I got an email the next day from a gentleman named Norman Shackley. And he said, he's in the UK, he's a British ham. He said, I want you to go back to their customs people and mention my name and tell them that I said it was okay for them to release your equipment. So I did that. I went back to customs. I said, do you know Norman Shackley? He said, well, yes, we do. He was our former director of customs. Well, please read this email that he sent me. And then, and they said, well, he wants you to release your equipment. And even with that, I still had a lengthy discussion with the current manager on duty about what is all this stuff? What do you do with it? Is it he kept thinking it's commercial or business oriented and I need to pay taxes on it? And I said, no, I'm not paying taxes. It's not commercial or business oriented. And we went back and forth and they finally released our equipment. So that that's one example of real time updates going around the world. And in this case, getting a very helpful reply back. That's real cool. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think that's all the questions I have for now. No problem. Anyone else? KN6 WQU. Go ahead. Uh, real question, uh, quick question. In the beginning of the slides, uh, can we can we revisit those slides so we can see the settings exactly um, on how to set up? Um, for the situation again? Absolutely. Thank you. I, I I apologize for that. Let me... This is the three settings you need to set up to be a hound. And you're probably familiar with these. And then you can go back to the frequencies table right click and select insert and then you get a new pop-up window where you can enter the mode and frequency that you want okay quick quick question here um after we insert uh the frequency of the fox um Operating as a hound tape. Oh, okay, so right here where we insert the frequency, we're inserting the frequency from the fox, correct? Yes. Now, yeah. now, will that frequency stay in there for future use, or do we have to do this every time, or eventually we'll, we'll have them all in there? One of the problems is if you keep doing this for different expeditions, your frequency table gets a little clogged up. Also notice when you right-click, there's a reset option. I will occasionally do that to just clear out stuff that I entered three months ago that I don't need anymore. But yes, that frequency will stay there forever until you delete it or reset it. Thank you for answering my question. Mm -hmm. And then I, I don't show it on this screenshot, but now that you've entered that frequency, you can select it from the drop down list that contains all the frequencies. And that was, like I said, that will stay in there until you delete it or reset it. Let's see, what else? 
Okay, did you see that? You saw this, I think, okay? Yes, we did. All right. One question is, uh, I've seen some people talk about foxhound mode in FT4 mode. And I've seen workarounds how people can activate hound mode, then exit the screen, come back into it in FT4, and then you're in foxhound on in FT4 mode. Is this just kind of a, a weird workaround that only a few people are playing with? As far as I know, there is no foxhound mode for FT4. It, it, if they're doing that, it, it's a non-supported uh, feature. Okay, yeah, I've seen it uh, just a, a few occasions and I couldn't figure out how to do it. I turned to the good old Google, uh, found out uh, kind of a workaround how you, you activate uh, uh, in hound mode, change your mode to FT4, exit, and then come back into it. And uh, I, like I said, I've only seen, I think, two or three times and I, I just could not find any documentation. So thank you. And it doesn't make sense to do that if there's no Fox on FT4 mode, <laughs> right? Absolutely. Yeah. And do we have any more questions from the audience? One more thing. <laughs> a lot of people want a 7-3 to end the conversation. Foxhound mode doesn't issue a 7-3. And I've gotten into little spiffs with people because they didn't want to log my contact without a 7-3, which we know is not necessary. Do you have people hang around on frequency uh, in not using Foxhound mode, just sending you that, expecting a 7-3 back? Oh, I, I will politely disagree with you. In this screen... In the yellow transmitted text, the fox is sending RR73s all over the place. Right. RR73 is one thing, but some people want that final, you know, I want to give you a 7-3 or I'm not putting it in my log. And so I've had people camp on me, uh, you know, trying to get a 7-3 out of me. <laughs> I was just wondering if you've ever run across anything like that. No. Uh, well, it's the fox sends an RR73, but then the hound sends nothing afterwards. That's that's normal. That's what's supposed to happen. Correct. If they're running the hound mode, but if they're just running standard WSJT, I've seen people just parked on frequency sending 7.3 after 7.3, kind of the, like you were talking to, uh, you know, to no one other than clogging up the frequency. What I would do is log the QSO regardless of mess seven three or not and you know whole, one way or the other at least if you log it you'll have a record of what happened do you ever have to go back to the adi or the log that's generated in wsjt and uh and export do you ever find that uh, some of these uh contacts that you made aren't logged into n1mm have you ever had to go that route? Yes, but it's not what you think. Um, so WSJT broadcasts through UDP messages to N1MM, and that works absolutely perfect. I've never had any glitches of any kind with that. Where I do have to go back, so... WSJT maintains a file called all.txt that contains all transactions ever done during the 10 days of my de-expedition. And I'll get requests for QSLs where somebody says, I, I'm not, I can't find my contact in club log. Would you look it up? And, and what I found is this is a person that used up their five opportunities for a QSO and I never received any reply report from. So I sent three active reports and I listened for two passive cycles. I never got any reply report that I could hear from that station. So does it count as a valid QSO? 
No, not, not in my opinion. Therefore, he doesn't get logged in either WSJT or N1MM, and he never appears in club log. So I get questions about, I think I worked you. Well, in my opinion, we did not have a two-way QSO. I transmitted to you, but I never heard any reply back. So it's not a valid contact. So that's what I do go back and look through those files. Uh, occasionally, I have to do that. Al, this is Jerry, WA6E. What, you mentioned UDP packets indicates you're using uh, internet as part of this uh, the expedition. Some of the locations I'm sure you've gone to are no more than a rock that's a foot or two above water at low tide. How are you connecting back to the internet? Using Starlink or something like that? Well, remember that the UDP is all on the same PC to localhost. So there's, there's no internet there. That, that's point number one. And um, I have stayed at places where the, the, some of these places are a little bit sneaky. They have a wireless router and they go into the setup page for the wireless router and they turn down the power output on the wireless router. So you have to be within like five feet of it to hear anything. Um, now, one in one place I went to that was in a store. I had to go in the store and be really close to where the router was to get internet. And even then it was very flaky. The good news is that has improved a lot. The last three or four expeditions I've been on, all the resorts we've been at have Wi-Fi access, very reliable. I haven't had any issues at all with that. You can even stream videos and whatever. It's, it's a whole lot better than it was 10 years ago. How many de expeditions have you been on and which was your favorite? You know, I want to, people ask me that and I said, I didn't know. So I went to count them and I came up with the number 28. Um, the last 10 or 11 years, they've all been in the Pacific. Probably the most memorable one for me is I've operated from Syria twice in 1994 and 2001 as Yankee Kilo 9 Alpha and Yankee Kilo 0 Alpha. And as you know, especially on the West Coast, Syria is in like the top five wanted on the West Coast. And you guys know Paul N6PSE. He recently visited Syria and he went to the building I operated from. And came away with the impression that now is not the time to schedule an expedition there. So maybe in the future. But uh, we that was just nonstop. We were there for two weeks, just nonstop pileups, anytime, any band, anywhere, uh, nonstop. And I, I'm sure you can sympathize with this. When you're in the Middle East, European stations are very loud, 20 over, 30 over 9. They won't shut up. They won't cooperate. They won't follow directions. CQ North America, Hotel Alpha 5, CQ North America, Italy Tango 9, and it goes on like that. Now, I can hear American stations. They're S6, S7, but they're covered up by Europeans. So what that does is it slows me down. In order to really, uh, you know, it'll, it'll go like this. Uh, the, the W6 again, Italy Kilo 2, W6 Alpha, Fox 6, W6 Alpha Delta. And, and it takes me two minutes to finally get the W6 call sign. It's kind of sad, but they will not cooperate. Now, that's going on today with Glorioso. He gets on and he says, no, Europe, outside of Europe. And all he gets is Europe calling. Al, are we any different when you're down in the South Pacific and you call Europe only? Do we respect that? For the most part, yes. Except California and Texas, right? No, no, I, I, I'd <laughs> say for the most part, it's not a problem. Um, 
Americans tend to stand by, the JAs tend to, tend to stand by. Um, getting back to the question about the expeditions, if you go to the, D, if you go to the Pacific, uh, the JAs can hear you really, really well. And they will hound you and follow you everywhere you go. Okay. And like I said, I, 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 I'm fine working Japan, but there's other people calling. I mentioned earlier that the Fox can do directive CQs. If I go to a really rare location again, I'll probably use that. And so even if Europeans are calling, they won't be displayed. So. Al, among all of the uh, diehard de-expedition guys, are there any plans being made or attempted to be made to go to Papa Alpha 5 land, that's North Korea? I I honestly don't know. I You guys might get a chuckle out of this. 20 years ago, I was tuning across 10 meters and I heard a guy in North Korea calling CQ with nobody coming back to him. I was very surprised. I didn't have time to turn my amplifier on. I called him barefoot. He came right back and we chatted for a few minutes. And I said, stay here. I'll announce you on the spotting network and other people will call. So I announced him on packet. And Apparently, we had a very brief propagation to Portland and Seattle, perhaps eastern Washington. And some guys in Seattle called him, and he was there for maybe 10 minutes, and then the propagation went away, and he was gone. This was the guy that worked for the World Food Program, and he made a North Korean license uh, part of his permission to enter the country and they gave him a license. Then they found out what he was doing and they didn't like it and kicked him out. Meanwhile, he had made thousands of contacts, several thousand contacts. <laughs> and, he had, and he had a valid license. I also worked him on RTTY. Did you get a uh, QSL card? I did. <clears throat> All right, wait, wait, stay right there. <clears throat> Jerry asking the most important question. Stay right there. I have I'm surprised it isn't mounted on the wall right behind him with blinking LEDs around it. <laughs> that's the, that's the DX of a lifetime. DX of a lifetime. A, put it in a safety deposit box. It's worth its weight in gold. Come on. Of course, you remember that was one of the questions on the trivia quiz last year. Uh, uh, yeah, how do you Dennis Robin might have uh, some contacts we could use. Well, I thought I thought it was on twenty meters. It it may have been on ten meters. I can't find that card. I wanted to show you. My friend Bob that I travel with needs two countries to have them all. Okay, and he needs he needs Glorioso, which is on right now, and so he's really hot to work Glorioso. And of course, he also needs North Korea. So I asked him, "Well, what you what were you doing twenty years ago, and how come you weren't working this guy?" <laughs> so anyway, well, I think that is a tremendous uh, for Super Fox to do digital signature. This is uh, very welcome because. So many times, you know, there's been some suspect stations out there and you have to keep checking club log to see, did I actually work the right station? So that's that's great news. You know, what, what I'll often do is when there's a pirate on, I listen and see who, who they're talking to and I look them up and see, is, is that being logged in real time? With, with the knowledge of that, not all of them log in real time, but it kind of lets me know if they're real or a pirate. I, I don't log in real time on my expeditions. I upload my log once or twice a day to Club Log. And uh, I have found that people really appreciate that. That, oh, yes, I am in the log on 160. 
or or I'm not in the log on 160. Would you be so kind as to check this? Most the expeditions won't do that. They'll just say, work me again. So I'll look the guy up and I find the guy's call was something UU and I log UV because I copied the CW wrong. That's my problem. So I corrected it. A lot of the expeditions won't do that. Any other questions? Well, thank you guys. It's been my pleasure to chat with you tonight. Have a good evening. Have a great evening. Thank you so much. All right. Bye for now.